Patrick Goudreau here, vegan author, animal advocate, and happy Monday to all of you. I'm here in Oakland, California. You can find all of my information at joyfulvegan.com. You can type that in below if you wouldn't mind, anybody, um, to encourage people to go check it out. I just posted a new blog post, which is actually an excerpt from my book on being vegan, which you can get on Amazon. And it is really my story about why I stopped eating meat, why I stopped eating animals. And I'm really proud of it. I really love this particular essay. And, uh, and I think it's something that you will be able to identify with your own story. And if you have not already stopped eating meat, I think it's something that you might be interested in because I think it will speak to your own values and your own ethics and your own story. Uh, the concepts that I talk about in general and in this essay in particular are universal and certainly not unique to my experience. I think they're pretty universal uh, because really the bottom line is most of us are really put off and offended by and disturbed by any kind of violence towards animals. Uh, it gets to us at our very core. It is a visceral reaction we have. Even if we see an animal who's been hit by a car on the side of the road, uh, there's certainly an element of disgust, but there's really uh, mostly a response to the potential suffering that animal may have experienced. And that's what we viscerally respond to. And yet, Often we close our eyes and close our ears and just put it aside and ignore it in favor of what is convenient, what is familiar, what is traditional in our own experiences. And what we're really ignoring is an integral part of who we are, a vital part of who we are, uh, which, which is, in my opinion, compassionate, um, caring people. And so I invite you to read the essay. You can link to it. Actually, Heather, hi, Heather, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just linking specifically to that story. It's, you know, ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com is the main URL. JoyfulVegan.com is a lot easier to remember. But if you could go to that uh, link, uh, it's on from the main page. It's called Why I Don't Eat Meat, and you can link right to it. And if you put that below, then people can easily link to it from here. So I invite you to ask your questions and ask me anything you want to know certainly about my experience but really about what my you know I want to hear about your experience what you encounter as a person of compassion what your challenges are if you haven't yet made the switch to to basically manifest your own values and your behavior what's stopping you what blocks do you have what challenges do you experience I'd love to I'd love to help you. And of course, you can go to the 30dayveganchallenge.com and that's where you can actually join the 30 Day Vegan Challenge. You can buy the 30 Day Vegan Challenge book. You know, my work is dedicated to you know, helping people remove the blocks to the compassion that's inside of them so that they can manifest their deepest values in their daily behavior. That's basically it. So I do everything I can to do that and that's one of the reasons we're here. So hello everybody and thank you so much Melissa, I really appreciate that. Hello uh, Keja, Kaja, I'm now I'm forgetting how to say your name. Keja, is that correct? Hi, welcome, good to see you again. Uh, I love hearing how you explain your position. It helps me be the vegan in the room and answer many questions about the lifestyle and why I don't eat meat. Thank you and you know one of the things we're going to be talking about a lot in the conference in August, it's possible we're going to be able to record the sessions but I'm not 100% sure yet, I'm still working on that but for those of you who are coming uh, for those of you who are interested in coming you know one of the most important things that we can do as advocates is be able to communicate our values in such a way that doesn't only speak to the truth of our own ethics and our own story but also that speaks to the values of the people we're talking to as I said I don't believe my situation is unique I believe everybody cares um, Kasha thank you I believe uh, I believe we have a great capacity to be incredibly cruel and violent and I believe we have a great capacity to be incredibly and fiercely compassionate and what we do at any given moment is make the decision in terms of what how we want to be and which we want to choose and certainly there are factors in our culture and in our society that makes it easier or more difficult to choose one or the other but in the end the decision is really up to us and and we do need to be part in my opinion as advocates 
of changing systems so that the, the, the decision to make the most compassionate choices are easier than more, rather than more difficult. And that's something we can all do in terms of changing policies, in terms of working with political candidates, in terms of local politics, and of course po po political engagement and political activism is also one of the things we're going to be talking about in the Compassion in Action Conference. So if someone else could actually type in compassioninactionconference.com, of course it's a long one, uh, then you can actually link right to it and just see what it's all about. We've still got half price tickets. Um, it's coming up on August 26th. It's here in Oakland, California. Uh, spread the word, especially to local folks. I mean, there's a lot of people who are in the San Francisco Bay Area who are up here in Northern California who are not aware of this conference. And I think, uh, I think it would benefit really everybody and will benefit everybody. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, everybody, for helping me. Uh, spread the word. So I'm hoping to record it to live. We'll see. And thank you, uh, Federico. So again, whatever questions you have, whatever comments you have, whatever challenges you have, whatever I can do to help you. Uh, Kasha, it's actually compassioninactionconference.com. So just add conference to that as well. It's a very long one. And uh, of course, share this video right now. There might be people on your page who have questions. There might be people on your page who have comments. There might be people, be people on your page who've never seen, you know, a vegan <laughs> before, even though I doubt it because there's a lot of vegans in the world. But what is more important for me than talking about veganism, certainly as a, um, as an end is to talk about uh, compassion and ethics and values as an end and veganism is the way to get there because that is really what being vegan is all about. The bottom line is being vegan is not about an end. It's not the end. It's not the goal. It's not about getting certified in being vegan. There is no such thing as vegan certification. I'm really sorry if that disappoints you. Some people may think they become certified and they get a little badge and they become part of a little club, but you don't. When you become vegan, you actually do not get any of those things. Uh, when you become vegan, what you get is this incredible experience and powerful experience of what it means to actually manifest your values in your everyday behavior. And that's pretty amazing because there aren't a lot of values and, well, certainly issues. There aren't a lot of issues that we can care about like social issues that we can do something about in our daily behavior. Like there are not a lot of social issues that we can every single day make a huge difference in. You know, there there's so many social issues, <laughs> but there aren't a lot and 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 caring about animals and not wanting to contribute to violence against animals, it's pretty incredible that one of the things we can do to to actually realize that is to not contribute to violence against them in very tangible ways like not buying the products that are not only symbols of violence against them but actual direct um, products of, of violence against them. So it's pretty, it's pretty powerful and, and it, it can be challenging because habit changes can be hard and we are creatures of habit and it can be challenging because as I've said in the past there are systems in place in our society that honor convenience over compassion and so in many scenarios it can be very difficult to make these changes because we're not encouraged to make the most compassionate choices and we're not encouraged to make the most healthful choices and there are literally systems working against us to enable us to do so 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 it's it's manifold, but once you make the change and once you go through that transition, the rest is really effortless. It really is about having a perception shift. Uh, Federico says, I am still eating meat, but since I've started seeing your blogs and information, I'm contemplating going vegan also for the love of animals. Well, Federico, what you are telling me is that you are a person of conscience and you are someone who loves animals and what you want to do is take that compassion and actually realize it in your behavior. And that's exactly what being vegan is. It is just a way to say, hmm, if this is something I care about, what am I doing to contribute to you know, harm against them? And what can I do to contribute to, uh, to non-harm? And, and being vegan is the means to get there. And it is, it's an incredible way to live. It's so much of the weight of the guilt, this kind of like low-level guilt we all have when we are eating animals goes away. I think that's the most liberating part of being vegan is that all of the little excuses we make, all of the all of the work we have to do to justify doing something that 
in our hearts and at our core we really don't feel very comfortable doing goes away. It's so liberating in that sense. It's not like you become perfect and it's not like you become every day is a joyful thing. Never day, no, they're never going to get any problems and you're never going to get sick and nothing ever, you know, bad's ever going to happen. But to remove a huge part of what enables us to be as unconditionally compassionate as possible, to remove this huge block, it really is like a weight is taken off of you and I, 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 let's just say I'm a fan of it. So whatever I can do Federico in your, um, you know, for your journey, you know, I've talked about the, the 30 day vegan challenge support group that we have. And if someone can put that link below as well, you can join that group. But of course I've got 12 years of podcast episodes you can listen to. Uh, you mentioned the blogs, I've got, you know, content all over the internet, articles, um, radio editorials, books, uh, what else? Uh, videos. So I try to work in every medium to be able to support you through your uh, journey and through your transition. I'm here for you. That is why I do what I do. So thank you for enabling me to be part of your journey and share my story with you and for trusting me uh, to, uh, to share your experience with me. I, I thank you for that. Um, so what else do we have here? Um, Elon says vegan 13 years now much respect right on Elon that's awesome and you're welcome Federico um, Kim hello Kim good to see you I learned a lot about how you handled keeping a vegan home as in bringing in no animal food or, or food actually what's really funny is I had an experience um, just just did I tell you this already I have uh, I keep you know I tell you about a lot of kind of you know, everyday things that happen in my life because it's usually relevant to the bigger story uh, of you know, living compassionately. And I have a new friend and I'm so grateful for her being in my life. She moved in across the street just back in February, didn't know her before then, and we have become fast friends and very good friends. And I really adore her. She is not vegan. She's not even vegetarian. We, you know, I've never, I've never asked her exactly what she eats. I don't have a checklist when I meet new people and ask them who they eat and what they eat. But I do know that she eats a lot of plants, and we have eaten many, many plants together. And she and her husband, and my husband and I, have gone out to dinner many times. We've had dinner many times, and they always order vegan when we're together. And I really appreciate that. And I've told her that it hasn't gone unnoticed. So we've been watching. Game of Thrones together every week because uh, we were both fans when we met and we watched season six together again just to get caught up and then we've been watching season um, seven and she comes over at here and last week she came and she had some brown paper bags with her and I said what are you bringing like your brown paper bag lunch like what you got she always feels compelled to bring something with her when she comes so she says now I have cookies I have vegan cookies for you and non-vegan cookies for me and I said you ain't bringing those non-vegan cookies into my house and she said oh well it's not like it's pork or anything if it, you know it's not so like egregious like that and I was like yeah I said it's really the same for us and we keep a vegan home and yeah you're not bringing those cookies in the house and I very quickly kind of you know just neutralized and I was like why didn't you just like you can eat the vegan cookies too and she said yeah I, I bought them at the bakery and I they didn't look that great to me and I was like well We'll have them if you want them, but so she said, "Can I leave the cookies like at it, like in the doorway?" And I was like, "Yes, you can leave them in the doorway." But, uh, but that's it. And the next day, I wrote, and it was fine, and it was not a big deal. And the next day, I wrote to her and I said, "You know, we never talk about it. We don't talk about me being vegan. We, you don't know me very long, and you don't really know what it means to me to be vegan." And I just told her, I said, "You know, for me, it really is very much about you know not contributing to violence against animals. And once you know, you can't unknow. And that's why we just." you know just take our values and um, and and extend them to our home and I said you know our home is a safe place amidst so much violence against animals and we create a safe place so that here we don't have to have any violence in our home and she wrote back and said you know she just absolutely understood and appreciated it and honored it and said that's one of the things I love about you so the point is there are absolutely ways to communicate our values you know and I talked about her dog and her love of her dog and you know that you know once you know you know if, if you knew what was happening to Nigel you know what happens to you know other animals if that same thing happened to Nigel you know you would be appalled and so 
you know, that will be an ongoing conversation. Perhaps someday we will have a deeper conversation about it. But the point is there are ways to communicate our values so we don't isolate the people who are in our lives who aren't at the point on the spectrum that we're at. And, um, and I'm glad, Kim, that that has been helpful to you. People ask me about that one a lot. I do have videos and podcast episodes on keeping a vegan home. And uh, you can search for it on my website and certainly on iTunes and YouTube and wherever else you... Um, wherever else you go to get the information. Um, so, uh, let's see, what do we have here? Uh, what else, what else, what else, what else, what else? Um, Jessica says, I'm a big foodie and I've been vegan for about five years. I, it's coming to the point where I get really frustrated when I'm out because I just want to be able to have a nice meal without having to Frankenstein a meal out of, uh, any vegan sides the restaurant offers. So here's what I have to say about that, Jessica. So much of what we experience is about perception and perspective, right? You and I have the same experience where we go out to a non-vegan restaurant and we ask for what we want. Your experience is that you're frustrated and your perception is that you're Frankensteining the menu to piece together sides to get what you want. My perspective is that it's an exciting challenge to be able to let the restaurant know that they've already got vegan options on their menu, they're just not calling them vegan, and here are all the different ways that we can create a really unique customized meal. <laughs> so, so a little bit of framing does change the experience. If you go into the situation when you're like, I'm really tired of this, I'm really sick of this, this is so annoying, why can't there be more vegan options? Now, that's not to say that we can't do restaurant advocacy and work with restaurants, and that's one of the things we're also gonna be talking about at the conference, uh, Christy Middleton and Milena Escherich are going to be talking about ways to work with non-vegan food professionals to get more vegan options in restaurants and um, institutions, etc. But um, so that's important, and you know, and 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 that is important. Period. But as just patrons of restaurants, I just I don't see it that way. I look at it as an exciting challenge, and I guess what I'm just saying to you is. Perhaps shift your perception a little bit and look at it differently. Look at it as an opportunity. Look at it as a way to communicate and to, you know, customize your meal. So I hope that helps. I know it can be frustrating sometimes because, look, the bottom line is restaurants are there to cater to really the meat-eating public. Restaurants do not exist for, you know, for much more than, you know, providing a service that they can make money off of. And one of the ways they're going to do that is by catering to the status quo. And the status quo happens to eat a pretty fair amount of meat, dairy, and eggs. So if you understand that, that, that they're not there to provide the healthiest options, they're there to, to, to make the most amount of money, then you understand why they make the decisions they do. But you have a say as a patron because you're there giving them your money and telling them what you actually want by virtue of how you're changing their menu. So there, you can look at it as a frustrating challenge or you can look at it as an opportunity. I happen to look at it as an opportunity. So just maybe just some food for thought to, to consider and see if that makes any difference for you in terms of the experiences you have in restaurants, okay? And let me know, let me know how it goes. Um, Diane, hi Diane, says, I wish I could attend your conference this year, but it just doesn't work out. Hopefully you'll continue to offer it and I'll be able to attend sometime. We'll see, Diane, every year. Well, this is the second year now, but every time I'm doing something that requires this much work, I, you know, I'm reluctant to say I'm definitely going to be able to do it next year because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of stress and it's a lot of, um, I mean, stress because I just want it to be really good and I want it to go really well and there's a lot of moving pieces and, uh, you know, managing it is, uh, as you can imagine, a pretty, pretty big endeavor. So I will not say I'm not going to do it again, but I will say that it's possible. We'll see how it goes. Um, so, uh, Kim says, I had to ask a beloved mentor not to put her lunch in my office fridge. It was awkward. Yeah, I understand. I do. I get it. So I'm glad it's been, it's been helpful. Uh, Tina says there, been, I've had some wonderful meals after telling the server I was vegan and letting the chef have fun with it. For sure. I've had really good experiences with that as well. Brandy says, I like when restaurants work with you. Indeed. One pizza joint flat out told me that they have no desire to make a vegan option as I could go elsewhere. This place just opened up. 
That's incredible. But again, it's, it's in keeping with what I'm saying is that they, you know, their perception is they don't have to do anything different than what they're doing because they're already catering to a very specific clientele. So why should they do anything different to bend over backwards to help you? That's their perspective. So those who do go out of their way, it's, you know, let them know that you appreciate it. Let them know that it's something, um, you really care about. Uh, and of course, I mean, of course there are vegan restaurants. I assume that, um, who was it? Was it, uh, uh, Jessica knows about vegan restaurants, but it's not always going to be the option. But of course, Happy Cow is a wonderful resource. People can um, people can look uh, take advantage of. Well, I do want to say something. If someone could please type this in below, there is a wonderful vegan burger joint in Oakland that has been a pop up uh, food truck for a while, and now it's looking to potentially take over the Encuentro space, which is in um, Jack London Square on Second. It's not a huge high traffic area, but look, there are places that are not high traffic areas, and with you know they, they become destination places. And No No Burger, their burgers are out of this world fantastic. So they're looking to do, they've got like, you know, tater tots, they're just doing a very simple menu right now, but if they stay, they're gonna do root beer floats and uh, and sundaes and really make it kind of like a, you know, just a real like burger joint and their food is fabulous. So it's called No No Burger, they're in Oakland and right now they're in the Encuentro space on second for the month of August um, from Thursdays to Sunday. And I really encourage everybody go let everybody know if you have friends in the Bay Area, let them know to go to Oakland. If you're in San Francisco, you can easily take BART, you can easily take the ferry over, they're right at Jack London Square, and, uh, and they're really fantastic. So I just wanted to give a little plug to No No Burger. I'm craving their burger, like I'm really craving their burger right now. I really want it. Uh, Diane says, I can certainly understand that it's a tremendous amount of work and that you may not be able to continue it, but I'll still look for you at other conferences. Indeed, Diane, for sure. Um, so what else do we have? I'm going to veganize their menu one day, says Brandy, about that restaurant. I love it. And Melissa says, the podcast about your trip to the Scottish Highlands has really inspired me to take such a trip. Maybe not exactly there, but a backpacking trip like that. It sounded wonderful. I'm so glad, Melissa. That's awesome. Um... Uh, Miroslav says, I feel that everything I've been learning from this community also helps me in all other aspects of my life. Cheers to nonviolence and courage for our humble pursuit to continue navigating these obstacles that impede us. More compassion, kindness, and you got cut off, but I think I got the gist, and thank you. That means a lot to me because that's what I've been trying to say for the last 25 years, is that this is about manifesting our values of nonviolence, of compassion, of kindness, of simplicity. That's you know, that's what I care about and that's why I live the life I do. And it's not about being vegan. It's about manifesting those values and being vegan is really the easiest and most direct and, and obvious way to get there, especially when you're talking about the big picture of not wanting to contribute to violence against animals. How amazing that there is a solution. That's why this thing called vegan is really, it doesn't matter in a way what we call it. Of course, I do believe words matter because that's what I focus on in my work, of course. But the point is we have been for millennia, I mean, for thousands of years, people have been thinking about the how it's disturbing and not in alignment with our values to literally bring animals into this world only to kill them. And well, and, you know, I'm talking about farming specifically, but uh, but also just even just harming animals at all for our own consumption. So this isn't new. We just have new names for it. We have new words for it. But this impetus, this um, this desire to not hurt animals is ancient and deep. And this is just 2017 and now here we are trying to do the same thing and calling it vegan. So really the values are as old as our human ancestry, in my opinion. So that's what I have to say about that. Michael says, repeating a question, what in your opinion is the best way to attract men, oh, did I miss that, Michael? Sorry. To veganism without appealing to perhaps irresponsible health or physical promises about plant-based eating. Yeah. So if you consider the fact that people make decisions based on their identity and values, not on facts or statistics, then when you consider the audience you're talking to, you do want to talk and speak to their values and their identity. Look, the truth is, in our culture, especially in the United States, I mean, you know, the identity of men happens to be a lot around masculinity and strength and 
courage. So there are other ways to speak, to speak, in my opinion, to masculinity and strength and courage than just talking about physical muscles. So if men have a notion that their values lie in them being able to be protectors, because that is, I think, a value that a lot of men hold, uh, protectors of their family, protectors of their children, then what about talking about them being protectors in the context of animals. If courage and strength is a virtue and a value that men value in our culture, then what about talking about the strength of conviction uh, in their lives and in the decisions they make? Do you understand what I'm saying? So what we have to do when we're speaking to the audience that we're speaking to, and I do think we have to always be mindful of our audience. I may have a bit of a different, uh, not message, because my message is consistent, but I might have a different way of conveying that message depending on what those values are and what the val you know who who holds the values who holds those values and what those values are does that make sense um, <laughs> so so does that make sense in terms of men I, I don't talk about muscles I don't talk about uh, fitness and weight gain or whatever but I do like to think that there's an audience of men who um, who respond to my message of compassion uh, because I think compassion is also a value that men hold and yeah they respond to it so you know they're gonna they are gonna respond to muscles and they are gonna respond to fitness but um, but I think there's other um, aspects of strength and courage and masculinity um, that they will respond to. The thing is, Michael, when we decide to do this, we have to do it again and 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 again. Uh, one of the things I'm going to be talking about at the conference in the Framing Your Values uh, talk that I'm giving is repetition of this message is key. We can't, so we have to understand that that the more we repeat the message, the more we repeat the, the issues, the more we repeat the, the solutions, uh, the more that that gets evoked and strengthened in the people's brains. And so we have to keep um, repeating them again and again. So test it out, test it out again and again, test it out and see how people respond. But you got to do it more than once. You have to do it more than once. It has to be something we decide to um, to to make part of our message. Kim says, great way to phrase the male thing, now a new talking points for me. Yeah, I actually, that's probably the first time I phrased it that way, and I, I that really resonates with me. So if someone can type that below, I'd really appreciate it, so I don't forget what I just said. But the values of masculinity, uh, again, in, you know, in terms of what my understanding is, in terms of this culture, are values of courage and strength and, um, and a value of protection. So certainly, yes, being protector of the environment, being a protector of the more vulnerable among us, right? Those are things that resonate with men. Being women, you know, and again, we're talking about archetypes. I'm not talking about stereotypes. I'm talking about archetypes. There are feminine archetypes and masculine archetypes, and the feminine archetypes do have to do with being nurturers. And so, you know, so those are the kinds of words, and that's the kind of language that women will respond to, where men will respond to language of a protector women will respond to the language of a nurturer does that does that resonate with you guys I'd love to hear your opinion Stoney says real men eat kale exactly and that's actually that also that conveying that message that meat does not convey strength that kale conveys strength that vegetables convey strength that non-harm conveys strength that meat actually conveys weakness we are we are hurting vulnerable beings who cannot escape from our our clutches and from our knives and from our cleavers uh, that doesn't denote strength uh, so so that's the kind of message that we need to keep conveying again and again and again it's why you hear me say my message over and over and over because we need to hear that message again and again to in order to strengthen it in our minds and in the minds of our audience um, Federico says that makes sense and that resonates with her. I love it. Her. Is it he or her? Say it's Federico. That must be a he, of course. Am I correct in assuming that Federico? Are you a man, Federico? Um, so what else? Um, do, 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 do. What's your thoughts on animal charity evaluators? Uh, if That's not the phonolytics folks, right, Diane? 
Oh, but no, that's the charity. So the, those are the ones who evaluate the efficacy of organizations themselves. Yeah. Um, I think there is uh, definitely value in that. I need to go look at what their criteria are a little more deeply to be able to give you an informed opinion. I will go look more deeply. If you have um, thoughts about that, I'd be interested in hearing them. But, but certainly it seems to me that they would have criteria for evaluating different animal organizations. And I guess maybe what you're asking me is do I agree with those criteria? And I would say... I don't know yet because I have to go look at the criteria. And Federico's a, a man. Thanks, Federico. Um, Stoney says, like Arnold said on SNL, girly men eat meat. Did he say that? That's a lit. Really? Did he say that? I didn't know that. That's really interesting. I did not know that. Yeah, I got it, got it, got it. Yeah, I, you know, I know enough about uh, language uh, in, in, uh, to, to know that would be a masculine O. Um, have I heard about the shark video critiquing them? No, I haven't. So that's why I'm obviously not speaking to what you're asking me. Kara's asking if I partied a lot in school. I don't know if it's really relevant <laughs> to this discussion. But uh, yes, I was a party girl when I was in, uh, in my younger days. It was. It's true. It's true. It was a long time ago. Long time ago. Does that answer your question? That's all I got to say. Uh, Tom says, hi, Colleen. This may be a weird question, but what are your thoughts on flu shots? I read that they use eggs to make them. Yeah, at this point, uh, Tom, there are no um, vegetarian um, cultures that they use, or I should say vegan because eggs are whatever, technically vegetarian. There are no non-animal cultures that they use to uh, create the flus. I, they're actually starting to, I just don't think they're very widespread. And this is one of those situations where this is where we have to say, okay, big picture, greater good, if this is about preventing an illness that could potentially kill you or your children or make you very ill, then that's not what being vegan is about. It's about doing the best we can to prevent animals from suffering. And the problem with animal suffering and when we look at the big picture is not because of the eggs that are being used for flu shots. It's because we raise 9 billion chickens a year, mostly for eggs and for their flesh. So what we need to do is make it really hard and more difficult and more expensive for animal products and byproducts to be used for things like creating uh, flu vaccinations. It's not going to be in uh, just focusing on flu vaccinations, but it's going to be in lowering the demand for eggs, for chickens' eggs, and for chicken flesh. Uh, that's why byproducts are used. Uh, byproducts are used because they're really cheap because we kill so many animals uh, every year. So. Focus on big picture, and uh, you know, we, we, you know, if we if we have an option, if we have a choice to choose the animal version over the non-animal version, let's choose the non-animal version. But sometimes there are situations in our lives, in our very imperfect lives, in our very imperfect world, where we don't have a choice, but we have to do something that uh, is right for ourselves or for our family. And in those cases, I would say, um, go with your gut. Uh, Colleen says, Marie Eve, I wrote support at joyfulvegan.com about. Uh, the process of getting you to come to Montreal, but I haven't gotten an answer yet. Did it go to the spam box? No, I will ask my assistant. Um, it was the weekend. I don't know when you sent it, but um, I will check to see and make sure that she got it. Thank you. Um, so I hope that helps Tom. And again, everybody, go check out the essay. Please share it. Uh, you can share it very easily from ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com or JoyfulVegan.com. Someone already put the link to the article in uh, the comments here below. So click, uh, click on it and um, and share it. You can share it on Twitter. You can share it on Pinterest. You can share it on Facebook. You can share it anywhere you want. And um, and please do. And let me know what you think. It's uh, excerpted from Beyond Being Vegan and. Um, I'm laughing at Michiko because uh, she's just trying to get attention right now. Uh, thank you for the inspiration doing what you do. Thank you, Eric. My pleasure. Michiko, you're just being a bad girl, Michi. You're going to fall. Michiko? Come here. Stop it. Stop it. Right now. Stop being so cute. Okay, she did. 
She has very short legs. Sometimes I wear them when she tries to um, jump up on things and she's not going to make it. <laughs> um, thanks, Diane. Thank you so much. Erin uh, says, I would really enjoy seeing you do a video aimed at kids who are vegan. I know you have a podcast about kids. Thank you for doing all you do. Erin, I absolutely love that idea, and I will, I will note that. I want to do some more videos for YouTube. Those, you know, vegan point of view videos really resonate with people, and they're so easily shared uh, and easy, easy to share. So, uh, so dire directing a video just to kids, I think it's great. Let me know if you have an idea. I do have to kind of think about different age groups. You know, there might be a one video that's geared towards kids who are five through eight, and then another video, you know, eight through. 11 something like that and then 12 through 18 or something I think there might be a, a way to do it that it focuses on different uh, ones um, so thank you says Tom about to make your Mexican chocolate cake for a bake-off oh I like it let me know how that goes um, Susan says great I say I totally agree thank you for all that you do thank you Susan thank you um, she wants to be on Facebook live who 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 Melissa did I miss something and what did I miss what did I miss what did I miss what did I miss? Who wants to be on Facebook Live? Oh, oh, Michiko. Sorry, it took me a second. Yeah, so here she is, being a poodly do. Doodly, doodly. Michi. See, she jumped from the chair. Now, she'll be able to jump down more easily, but she was jumping from the chair up there, and it was just a, a long jump. Michiko, you be careful. You be careful. And right next to me is Charlie. Wait, can you see Charlie? Yeah, you can. You, you don't see like a black furry body. Trust me, it's Charlie. All right, everybody. Well, um, I love that you're all like making my recipes. Thank you so much. Um, you're all talking about these baked goods, which, um, yeah, that's just too tempting right now. I just ran five miles today, so I won't be having any baked goods. I've been snacking on dates because dates are like nature's candy. They're not like nature's candy. They are nature's candy. All right, let me just read a couple more things, and then I'm going to head out. Uh, by the way, your last podcast episode was so positive and insightful, stepping stones and baby steps to break those walls. Uh, Marie Eve, are you talking about my Food for Thought podcast with, uh, with um, Stephen uh, Wells on ALDF and animal law? I appreciate that. Thank you. Melissa said, little stinker, you lost your cat and you needed a kitty fix. I'm so sorry, Melissa. Yeah, it is so hard when we lose these little loved ones. And I feel so grateful every day to be able to share my love with her. She's amazing. Uh, Miroslav says, Colleen, when we uh, were in Scotland, the ice cream and cheese seemed so much better. Any possible reason for that? How they create process? I don't know. Like, I, obviously, you're talking about the vegan ice cream and cheese, I assume. Um, I don't know. That's fantastic. Cool. Um, okay, I'm heading out. I uh, need to go. I don't have to make a reason for why I'm going, but it's 6 o'clock, and I'm going to go get dinner ready for me and my husband. And I wish you all a lovely evening, and thank you for sharing this video, and thank you for your honesty and your openness and your awesomeness and I'm really grateful for your follows and shares and um, and your trust. So thank you for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thanks for watching.